this morning with all of you, uh, an honor and a privilege. You know, in my long life of 29 years, <laughs> I can relate to all of you, right? <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty young, but as I look back on the last 25 years of my life, I, I became a, did I do that math right? Yeah, I did. I became a Christian when I was four, and as I look at the last 25 years of my life, sometimes I get discouraged when I look at uh, what's going on in the world and see some of my friends walk away from the faith um, to see, uh, you know, brokenness in my extended family. Uh, I start looking at my own life and I say, how can I continue to follow Jesus? Sometimes, like, it, it just gets difficult in my own mind and heart with temptations that I face and things that I'm going through of how can I stay faithful? And the thing that I've gone back to, other than God's Word, which needs to be paramount above anything else, is I look at the people who are older than me who have persevered in the faith. They've seen people pass away. They've seen friends and family members walk away. I'm sure you have all seen that in your life. And I look to the example that your, your age bracket has set. And it fills my heart with confidence and joy, knowing that people continue to walk with the Lord even through difficult situations. So when I look at my 25 years, it's not long. And even though sometimes I'll get, you know, in my head and, man, can I really keep doing this? The blessing of faith that God has given us to persevere through anything is a gift like nothing I've ever seen. So I, I just want to encourage all of you. You are people that I, like, I don't know a lot of you. I just moved here a year and a half ago. But whenever I'm in a situation that I really need guidance with, you guys have the experience. You've seen it. You know. You are valuable and needed in the kingdom of God and in the church. And it's a testimony in my life. So I, I thank you for your faithfulness. Even coming to worship the Lord every Sunday, singing with the piano, reminds me of my little Baptist church in Ohio. I love it. And it's like I said, it's a joy to be here with you this morning. A uh, little bit about me. My name is Chris Kish. Um, I went to Bible College in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, 2012 to 2016, studied to be a pastor, got a minor in counseling, moved out to San Diego uh, in 2016, 2017, helped start a church. I was a pastor out there for a couple of years. Um, also, pause, I want to say hello to Michael. I heard Michael's joining us on, online. Hello, Michael. Um, <laughs> but uh, I helped start a church out there, uh, pastored out there for a few years, and um, then I heard about Family Church and their residency program and their mission to reach communities all across South Florida with the gospel and with new churches, and I love that. And I'm like, man, I want, I want to join this program and learn more and train up to be a pastor with Family Church. So um, something that's really passionate on my life is two things. One is discipleship, and the other one is people understanding that they are needed and loved and valued, and to know that they can still serve in the body of Christ. And something that I made, uh, pro I think it was 20, 2017 or 2018, um, I, I wrote down a bunch of names of people that my life has impacted. Uh, so, like, if I had, if I would ever sin in a big way, who would be impacted by my choice? Because, like, our choices impact people. So, like, I haven't even had my first kiss yet. So, like, I'm, I'm waiting for marriage, for all of that. And, uh, you know, with, with that thought, though, there comes temptation. And I'm like, okay, if I were to ever really give in to crazy temptation, who would be impacted by that choice? And I started writing down names of people that I know who pray for me and love me and I love them and it's a mutual relationship. That's not the point of why I brought this. This hangs on my wall. And every night I get on my knees, I, I pray by my bedside before I go to sleep. And I look up at this and I pick a name off of it and I pray for that person. Uh, if I know that they're not a Christian on this list, pray for their salvation. If I know they are, then I'm asking God that they would know they're valued and loved in the church and that they can offer something and that the church would capitalize on that and use 
the gifts that they've been given. And there's a whole section on here. Here's the names. All those teeny little things are all the names. Says my choices impact many. There's a whole section up in here. My home church, Camden Baptist Church, in a small country town in Ohio. And there's names on here, like, uh, let's see, Rose Randolph, Evelyn Radcliffe. Uh, let's see, Kay Henderson, Harold Henderson. Charles Kerr, Linda Kerr, Sarah Mosier, Bill Moeller. I can keep going on and on. People that I know love me. And when they come up to me, sometimes they say, Hey, Chris, we're, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. And when they tell me that, I know they're praying for me. Like sometimes someone will come up to me and like, Hey, Chris, I'm praying for you. No, oh, thank you. And it's kind of passive. But when one of those... Uh, older people at Camden Baptist Church come up to me and say, hey, Chris, hey, hey, Christopher, I'm praying for you. I know they're going before God on my behalf, and they're invested in my life, and I love that because they're, they're living out the, the mission that God set them on to care for people in the church. And, like, I look to them, and I see their example, and I, I want to get to know more of you as I continue to serve here at the downtown campus. Uh, but I know that there's people in your life you're praying for and going to the Lord on behalf of them. Um, so I just want to encourage you that my age, people and younger, man, we need you. We need you to pray for us and encourage us and give us life advice when we think we know everything, but man, we don't know anything at all, but we think we do. But we need, we need you, I need you to speak truth into my life when I'm believing a lot. And that's what these people do. I look up at this, hanging by my bed. I pray for them and say, God, would they know that they are valued and needed in the church? So that's the frame that I want to start all of this off with. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, 7 through 10. It's also on the handout I passed out if you want to look at that. It's out of the ESV. Before I read that, I want to go ahead and pray first. Father, thank you for this morning, for the opportunity that we all have to hear from you and your word. I pray that you would encourage all of us, challenge us to live on mission, knowing we can do it because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, God, thank you for the men and women in this room. After this morning, may they just feel encouraged and know that they're needed in the kingdom of God and in this local church here at Family Church. Bless the reading of your word, and uh, Holy Spirit, may you help us to understand it, maybe in a new way, uh, or in a way that helps us just be reminded of it. It's in your name we pray, Jesus, amen. amen. <laughs> Alright, so Galatians 6, 7-10. through 10. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are in the household of faith. That's here, that's the church. Let us do good to those in the church. When, when we sow to the flesh, we reap corruption. In my own life, I can be really selfish in a lot of things, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room that can be selfish sometimes. We probably can all relate to that. And when we sow to that, we'll reap corruption. But when we're sowing uh, to the Spirit, we, we reap eternal life. And then it says uh, in verse 9, Do not grow weary in doing good. It says doing good right there at the beginning of verse 9. And then uh, halfway through verse 10, it says, So then, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to everyone. So part of the doing good, a, a key part of that doing good, is, I believe, discipleship. And we can even see that at the beginning of this chapter, Galatians 6. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, if any believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path mentorship, right? That's discipleship. That's helping, coming alongside someone. And then it says, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. 
but share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. And all throughout the Gospels, Jesus modeled the perfect uh, example of discipleship. He did a great display. That's why he came. You know, John, John 17, Jesus, when he's praying to the Father, he says, I finished the work that you sent me to do. And that was before he died on the cross. What was the work he sent him to do? It was to start a movement of disciples. Yes, it was to die, and it was to come back to life, because that sealed everything for us. But before that, the other 33 years of his life was preparing for and launching a discipleship movement among people that helped grow the church. He said it before he died, John 15, abide in me, all about discipleship. And then he said, make disciples again before he sent it up into heaven. Normally, someone's last words before they pass away are profound or something special sometimes. At least they are in Hollywood movies. But, <laughs> um, but I, I, heard, I heard the last words of my grandma, um, the last words to me. And, um, I know my dad has with his parents, my mom with hers. And, like, they're, they're rich and they're full, and it's like the last thing they really want you to get. And Jesus repeated himself before the cross. Make disciples, abide in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Go and bear much fruit. That whole thing in John 15. And then Matthew 28. Go and make disciples. Go baptize them. So he's called all of us to this universal mission of making disciples no matter what age we're at. And what Galatians is saying is don't grow weary in doing that good. What's the good? It's coming alongside of people who are struggling, helping them, mentoring them. That's the good that we're to continue doing no matter the age. So there's uh, a great format for discipleship. Um, it comes from Sun Life Ministry, S-O-N, Sun Life Ministry. Uh, the guy who discipled me and is still discipling me, his name is Dean Plumley. Um, he works with Sun Life Ministry. He trained me up in four chair discipling, which is what we're gonna go through today. It's on your handout. But it's a very practical way to look at discipleship and look at your own life and say, okay, what chair am I in? And how do I move to the next one? Or if you're mentoring someone, or you want to, or you have that granddaughter, grandson, niece, nephew, whoever, that you really want to come alongside of, you can look at what chair might they be in? How can I encourage them to take a next step in their faith and in their walk with Christ? Or in the first place, take a step in their walk with Christ by coming to repentance. Um, and then you can kind of like track where they're at. Through, through these chairs. There's a lot of different methods for discipleship. I'm not saying this is the best one or the only one. But for me, I'm a visual guy, and it's helpful for me to see, this is where I'm at, this is where they're at. Let's move closer to the bearing much fruit that Jesus talks about in John 15. So, uh, chair number one, right there is the lost chair. That's for the person who is not a believer, they have not yet put their faith in Jesus. And there's an invitation given to that person. And that invitation is come and see. And we see that in John chapter 1. Uh, Jesus is calling the first disciples. And they say, where are you going? And Jesus says, come and see. That's, uh, that's John 139. Where are you going? He said, come and you will see. And then you skip down a couple of verses, Nathaniel uh, and Philip are talking, and he said, where are you going? And he said, come and see. So it's this continual invitation to come and see. That's what kicks off discipleship. That's what kicks off that relationship. Because before we can do any discipleship with anyone, we have to make sure we understand in our own minds, discipleship is not a program. And I've made that mistake before with people where I want to sit down with them and I want them to know Jesus more, but I treat them as part of a program to get them to move places and the relationship never really was formed. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure first and foremost that we love the person that we're going to meet with and spend time with. Mm -hmm. Jesus loved his disciples. He loved his apostles. He spent time with them. We have the same opportunity to love people because we share the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had. The same love, the unity that Jesus talked about in John 17 between him and the Father. We can have the same unity between us and others. 
uh, in, in the church, and we want people to get to that point. So we give them that invitation to come and see. And some will come and see and leave. Some disciples that were following Jesus turned and left. And then he turns to Peter at one point, and he says, what about you, Peter? Are you going to leave too? And Peter's like, where else would I go? You have the words of eternal life. Why would I leave that? But he came, Peter came, he saw, and he tasted and saw that the Lord was good. And he continued to follow Jesus. And other people come and they see, and it's not really for them. So we pray for those people. We don't give up on them, we pray for them. But man, there's people that are ready. So pray that God will bring into your life people that are ready to move into that step of repentance. So with every chair, there's a title for it, and there's an invitation for that person. So chair one is the lost. The invitation to that lost person is come and see. Come and see Jesus. When they get saved, they move into chair two. Chair two is the believing chair. That's the person who just put their faith in Jesus. They are now a child of God, redeemed and blocked by the blood of Jesus. And they are now in the believing chair, and the invitation to them is to follow me. Jesus says, okay, you came, you saw, you want to you wanna walk with me? Okay, oh, now follow me. And remember, I don't have a place to lay my head tonight, so I'm not saying this is easy, but I'm inviting you now to follow me as I, as I walk. First uh, John 2, 6, if anyone would want to follow Jesus, he must walk as Jesus walked. So it's this walking with Jesus. And that's, that's the invitation given to that person. Some interesting uh, statistics on this chair. Chair 2, the believing chair, that's where 90% of Christians stop. They put their faith in Jesus, they're a Christian, they're in church, they're going, they're attending, they believe, they know they're in a relationship with God. And praise God, that's where it starts, but that's where a lot of people stop. And that's just the beginning. Like, this is where everything launches into the movement that Jesus came to start, which is discipleship. Which is what I talked about when, when uh, we first started. Like, I personally, like I said, am so blessed by everyone who continues to walk by faith in Jesus Christ. Let that faith spur you on to continue to work, which would be chair number three, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, what's interesting is if if there was that I said interesting, it's actually kind of crazy and sad, but I'll step over here so you guys can see that. Sorry. Um, if there is a church of I believe it's uh, one thousand, and one person in that like everyone in that church, all one thousand people, led a thousand people to Christ um, a day. And they did that. Yeah, I know, right? I saw your face. That, that'd be a lot, right? If they somehow did that, uh, and all 1,000 did that for 100 years, it would take 10,000 years to reach the whole world for Christ. That's a long time. Yeah. But if one person leads someone to Christ <coughs> and trains them up and mentors them, and disciples them to go out and train someone else, and while they're doing that, you that person finds someone else, and you just keep like spreading through the power of multiplication 10,000 years goes down to 17. 17 years to reach the world for Christ if people are discipling others to go out and live on mission. That's more doable. Will it happen? Not everyone's going to come to repentance, but God's heart is that they would. So we go out and we seek out people. And I'm sure you guys know people in your life, you're probably thinking of names in your own mind right now of I want this person to come to know Christ. Or I want this person to take that next step of really knowing Jesus more. Like you guys model that faith in your life. Pass it on. Share it. That's what God's called you to. And when you do that, you move into the working chair. And that invitation is fish for men. So Jesus is great at giving invitations. To the lost person, he said, come and see. Check it out. When they believe and they want to follow, he says, all right, follow me. Okay, you follow me for a while? All right. It's time to put you to work. You're not going to fish for fish anymore. You're going to fish for... Yeah. You're going to go out and you're going to love people. And you're going to try to bring them in. And some are going to reject you. 
and some are going to beat you up, but some are going to have a life transformation happen for them. That's worth it. Go and work. Do the stuff. That's the Chris Kish translation. Go do the stuff. <laughs> but Jesus is inviting people into that. Go and fish for men. <coughs> Working chair. Uh, I want to make sure I don't skip anything here. So workers um, are after more. If you want to write down this acrostic, it's A-F-T apostrophe R. A-F-T apostrophe R. When you are a worker, you need to look at your own life and in the person's life that you're wanting to mentor or disciple and bring alongside of you. The A stands for available. Am I available to be used by God? Look at your own life. Do some self-assessment. Am I currently available to be used by God? Number two for the F, faithful. Am I faithful in my commitment to grow to be like Jesus? Am, am I faithful in my commitment to grow to be like Jesus? The T is teachable. Am I teachable in my actions and attitudes? That one's also really important for someone that you're mentoring or wanting to disciple or pour into a little bit. Some people are teachable, and I'm sure we know people who are not. Mm -hmm. Pretty hard-headed. It's hard to get through to them. Pray for them that God would break down the walls that they have up that are blocking truth from coming in. But if you are, <coughs> like like I said, I'm sure there's people we're thinking of. And you've tried and you've prayed and you're trying to get through and it's just not really working. Just pray. Pray for them. Don't chase them. Pursue them. If you keep chasing that person, you might get burned out and tired. Like I said, there's people that are ready to go. My dad prayed for his dad's salvation for probably close to 40 years. My dad got saved when he was 16. Um, and then after he got saved, my grandpa would make fun of my dad for being a Christian and made fun of him for going to church and having his Bible open. And my dad just kept on praying. And then he married my mom and then both of them prayed. And then I was born and my sister was born. And then as a family, we prayed. And faithfully, he prayed for his dad's salvation over and over and brought it up whenever he had an opportunity. And two months before my grandpa passed away, he put his faith in Jesus. My dad's like, here's the gospel. Like, do you want to respond to it? My grandpa said, yeah, if there's time. My dad's like, there's time. Uh, wasn't much time left, but there was some. So keep praying. Don't grow. Galatians 6. We just read it. Don't grow weary in doing good. Continue. Even when it's hard and you're like, I've been praying for this person most of my life. That's work, right? It's kind of draining. God has not forgotten. His desire, his heart is that all would come through repentance. So keep on praying. That's working in and of itself. But Jesus does want us to also invest in people who are ready to go. Because there's people around you right now that do have a teachable heart. So you ask yourself, this person that I want to invest in, are they teachable? And you might have to ask yourself, am I teachable? Am I willing to learn more and then share that with other people? There has to be teachability on both sides. That'll work. Uh, it works. The last one is R, which is responsive. Am I responsive to the vision of those leading? That's also a great one for those that you are mentoring or that you care about. Are they responding well to the vision that you are casting as they go out and try to serve Jesus? So workers are after more. Am I available? Am I faithful? Am I teachable? Am I responsive? Uh, in Luke 10 2, Jesus sends out the workers. He says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Like, man, there's so much work to do. And for anyone who has the Holy Spirit, like Acts 1.8 says, we have the power of God within us to go and do this mission. And Jesus said at the end of Matthew 28, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Like, 
He will never leave us or forsake us. We're not doing this ministry on our own. Like we are together as family church from the fifth grade young leaders all the way to legacy adults. It's this movement of people that want to reach communities and make disciples. God is not done with you. Like I said, like I look at this list of people and I think about the uh, older ones in the church that pray for me and continue in faith. And it fills my heart with this joy knowing that there's people that are still doing everything for the Lord. And my passion in my heart is that everyone would get it. Be refreshed with it again to take those steps in ministry, in life, and reach out to people and do the work that God has blessed us with the opportunity to do. We don't have to do this. He's not making us. But he did die so that we could. He came back to life so that we could have new life in our own life and share that with other people. We've been called to a great mission. All right, the last chair is the disciple-making chair. Disciple-maker. And that's go and bear fruit. That's the invitation that Jesus gave. Go and bear fruit. And that's right out of John 15. There's four different types of fruit listed in John 15. No fruit, more fruit, better fruit, and much fruit. And Jesus wants everyone to get to the much fruit section of that text. That's why he says over and over, repeated in John 15, abide in me, abide in me, don't depart from my love. That Greek word for abide has the word <coughs> picture of setting up camp and not moving. Putting down the tent pegs and you're there. And you just abide in the love of Christ. Someone told me uh, when I was out in California, we were talking about this idea of getting burnt out in ministry and feeling discouraged and all these things. And he said, you know, if you abide in Christ, and my mentor, Dean, who I also talked about, he, he told me something similar. When you're abiding in Christ and you're setting up camp underneath the love of God, you are going to be filled up with God. Ephesians 3.19, to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. Like it's this filling that we're getting by setting up camp and not moving. But what happens in ministry and in life and with people that we know is we try so hard to reach them that we're pouring ourselves out and we're getting dried up, burnt out, exhausted. And the guy in California said, what if someone just pretended their life was a cup and you put it underneath the faucet and you didn't move? then who around you is in your splash zone? For when the water fills up and overflows on the cup, you're not going to get burned out because you're not leaving the abiding of the love of Christ. You're sitting there. And because you're being faithful in that, who's going to benefit from your faithfulness by abiding in Christ? And I love that word picture. I love that analogy because all too often, especially in ministry, I can get burnt out in it. One of one year, man, I was I felt so far from Christ, and that's when I was it was 2014. I was a sophomore in college, and I was hired as my summer youth or yeah, my church's summer youth intern. And that year, I felt the farthest from Christ. I was in the Bible every day, doing Sunday school, boys devotions, planning a sermon, like uh, outreach events for the youth. I maybe had my own personal Bible time, like four times that summer. Yeah, that's bad. And I got burned out. And I was trying to do ministry from a place of uh, what I already knew instead of what I was constantly being reminded of in the Word of God. And we can all get to that place in our life where some of these spiritual habits and disciplines take a, a back seat for a time. And what Jesus is saying is, I want you to get too much fruit so that requires you to abide in my love. That's so good. Just let him do the work. He did it on the cross. And we remind ourselves of the gospel daily. We become fluent in speaking the gospel into everything. And when we do that, we become a disciple maker. So a lost person gets saved. They move into chair two. They become a believer. And then when they start working, that means when they either start 
training up someone who's in the believing chair, or they start evangelizing the lost, that Christian has moved into the working chair now because they're doing what Jesus asked them to do. When that person leads this chair two person into chair three, so now that this person is doing the work, the chair three person has moved into the disciple maker chair because they have now made a disciple. My main spiritual gift is evangelism. I love sharing the gospel. And I love watching people get saved. But the joy that I experience when I see someone else that I've led to Christ lead someone else to Jesus and start discipling them, or when someone I'm discipling calls me and just starts encouraging me with the word of God, I'm like, man, that's it. Like, that's the heart of God behind this whole movement that Jesus started when he came to earth was to encourage us to do the work of ministry, which is making disciples. And we can all do it. We have the power of God living within us because of what Jesus did on the cross and our faith in him. For some people, the, the burden may be stronger. For others, not as much for people to get saved. I would challenge and encourage all of us to ask God for a reminding of the beauty of a changed life from sin to death. I passed from death to life. I think that's John 5, 24. Passing from death to life. Like, be re like get excited again about that. And then take next steps to disciple people. Um, I, for the last, I think, three sections now, I teach a class down at the end of the hallway called Discipleship. Uh, and primarily, it's been just young, uh, just all young adults, which is great. It's great to see people my age interested in wanting to reach out to their friends and make disciples. Uh, and we're, we're going through the Pursue Devotional, which Family Church Institute put together. And it's so reproducible because you go through it you know, learn a little bit about the Word of God, be refreshed with truth, and then you take that and sit down across from someone that you know, and you go through the Word of God. And it's a very simple tool used, which would I would put in, in this working chair, like if you could put the Pursuit Devotional in a category, it's right here, or right around here, because you're using it to reach these people to take next <coughs> steps in their walk with Jesus. It, it's a great tool. Uh, I don't know if you have read through it or, you know, uh, I think you've probably seen it at this point, but um, I would I would challenge you, you know, as you think of names in your own head, like I say, grandchildren or nieces, nephews, friends, um, they need to see the faith continue throughout life. The culture today is pushing all of the, like if the Christian culture church is pushing so much of the entertainment and the the big lights and the music and like all of this big 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 stuff and at the end of the day people need to know that god loves them and that there's a next step they can take in their spiritual walk and that faith is a real thing and they're going to look maybe not yet but at some point i know i am right now they're going to look to you as the ones who have gone through life, seen a lot, cried a lot, rejoiced a lot, grieved a lot, you've gone through life, you, you know. They're going to come to you for answers. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have in you. Right? That's the mission God's calling you to. I need you. Genuinely. I pray for these people before bed. And when I get to one of those names of someone much older than me, God, help them to know they're valuable and needed in the church. And I want you to be reminded of that today. This is a great step for how you can start ministering to people that you know. Because people need you. The kingdom of God needs you. Family church needs you. I need you. And God delights in the faith that you show and model to the next generation. I love you guys. I want to get to know you more. I love Family Church. I'm happy to be here.
Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, Father, thank you again for this group of men and women. And I pray that you would encourage them and challenge them in a fresh way to live on mission and to show their faith to the next generation who's going to need to see solid faith lived out. Help them to continue to persevere. And thank you that you who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. That is so good. We can't do it on our own, but you can, and you are faithful to it. We love you. Thank you that you love us more. In your name we pray. Jesus, amen. amen. So, just asked me to come in. I, I promise you, I did not tell him what to teach. No. I promise you, because he talked about things that we've talked about the last couple of times that we've been together.